Good morning, family. It's so good to be with you again today. Another Lord's Day. And I have the privilege once again to be able to share with you a message from the Word of God. Today, our message is coming from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14 and verse 1. And we've entitled the message, Comfort for a Troubled Heart. Let's read it together. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for this, another new day, a day we've never seen before, a day filled with new mercies and compassions. In Lamentations, it tells us that it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His compassions, they fail not, they are new Every morning, great is your faithfulness. So we are blessed in your faithfulness, O oh God. And we ask for your understanding today, that you would illuminate our thinking, that we might uh, understand and see the truth. And then help us not to stop there, because it is in the doing of it that we show you how much we love you. So we ask, Father, that your word will serve as a lamp unto our feet, a light into our pathway. And as always, may the words of my mouth, the meditation that is in my heart, may it be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Comfort for a troubled heart. There is no person that has come into humanity greater than our Lord Jesus Christ. God's plan before the foundation of the world was that the second person of the Godhead would come into the world and, and redeem us from our sin. Biblical Christianity is unique from other religions in that the God we serve reaches out to us and desires a relationship. Not that he needs it, but he allows for it. And so in the Gospels, we, we see the intimacy of this, of this relationship that we can have with God through Jesus Christ. In the first chapter of John's Gospel, verse 14, we find these words, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. First John 1 and verse 1 says, John again says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. The calling of the disciples by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he was with them on earth for approximately three and a half years. They were able to see his life. Think about it. It was the life of God. God himself for the answer to Philip to show us the Father. Jesus says that when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. They saw his life. They, they heard his words. They were able to be eyewitnesses of the very miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They don't understand it all. They, they don't comprehend everything, but 
But we know from their words and what they heard from others that that this is no ordinary person. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. They hear, they, they say, what manner of man is this? That even the winds of the sea obey him. They heard others say, never man spake like this man. And even the disciples on the Emmaus road, they say that our hearts burn within ourselves when we heard him speaking. Chapter 13 of John sets it up for our message today. And in chapter 13 and verse 1, a feast is mentioned and it is the feast of Passover. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should be, that he should part out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This Passover is a seven-day celebration that has its history back in Egypt when Israel was going to exit and the plagues and the death of the firstborn. God telling the men to represent their families and to slay the lamb and apply the blood on the top and side posts and death was coming into Egypt but when I see the blood I will pass over you. And so the Passover feast was a seven day festival of celebration honoring and commemorating the Passover back in Egypt. This particular Passover would be uh, Jesus' final week on earth. It would be the week of his death. And the subject was, according to verse 1, that my hour has come. I'm, I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to depart. And I'm getting ready to go and be with the Father. Once the supper is ended, Jesus does something that becomes the, the premier example of servant leadership and how he took off his garments and he took a towel. He began to wash the disciples' feet. He tells them, if I am your Lord and Master and if I wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. The humility of servant leadership, how he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took on this form that we see of a servant. You'll notice that the conversation during this time with his disciples in verse 31 through 38, again, is all about his return to his father. We find in verse 31, therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. In chapter 17 of John's Gospel, in verse 5, Jesus talks again about this return to glory. He would say, in the prayer, Father, uh, restore to me the glory that we had before the world was, which shows the, not only the deity of Jesus Christ, but the birth of Jesus was not the beginning of Christ. He is the eternal second person of the Godhead. He is the Son of God who had the same glory as the Father, but he veiled that glory to come into this world to have an intimate relationship with the disciples, to die for our sins and to redeem us from our sins. This intimacy is coming to an end, they thought, because now Jesus is saying, it's time for me to go back. Notice he says that you're going to seek me and you're not going to find me. And where I'm going, you can't come. Wow, can you imagine the trouble in the heart that would come from this 
this thought of being separated from so great a savior, great a person. You've seen his life. You've heard his words. You've seen the miracles. You've been with him for three and a half years. John said we, we handled him. We saw him. We looked upon him. This, this was an intimate relationship. And now he says, I'm going back to the Father, and you're going to seek me. You won't find me. And where I'm going, you cannot come. Now, I can't think of any other experience that we've had where we would be troubled in the absence of a person or person. But I can give you some examples so that we can, we, can, we can have a sense of what they may be feeling and the trouble in the heart. You remember the first time, perhaps, if you go back, you were, you, you were born into the world. You don't remember that, but you know you had parents and uh, those that raised you. And then somewhere around five years old, you get dropped off at kindergarten. Wow. Your parents leave you. You're there with people you don't know, a building you, you, you're not familiar with. I can't imagine the feelings of a child kindergarten for the first time. What about those of you who were dropped off? You thought your parents were coming back only to realize that now you're in foster care. Wow. What about those who are going to college for the first time? Your, your parents take you to college, they drop you off, you, you're at this university, and, and now you're experiencing this, what appears to be all alone. What about those of you who've been married, you've been married for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and all of a sudden, your spouse dies. You're feeling alone. There are many of you that you're the only one in your family that's left. All of your siblings have died. The feeling of troubled heart of being alone. And then what we're all experiencing today, many of us, from what has been called social distancing. Many of us can't get to our families. Our families are not coming to us. Many are in nursing homes and hospitals. They haven't seen their families other than maybe a window visit or a phone call. These feelings of troubleness, we, we can only somewhat imagine what they felt. When Jesus says, where I'm going, you won't find me. And uh, you can't come where I'm going. But then he gives further clarity in the text. And he tells the disciples, but a new commandment I'm giving to you. And I give it to you that you love one another. And as I love you, so you love one another. This will be the witness that you belong to me will be your badge of love. He says, by this will all men know that you're my disciples because you love one another. The love that I showed you is the love that you're to have one to another. Wow, what, what a testimony that we should have as believers to love one another. It is actually a witness to the world and maybe through our actions, uh, we are not being that witness we should be, but it is what Jesus said to his disciples. Peter then says in the text, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says that and gives further revelation. Peter, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter then says, again, where are you going? Don't you know I'll lay down my life for you? It is in this context that Jesus would remind Peter that before the cock crows thrice, Peter, you're going to deny me. Jesus continues the dialogue with his disciples in chapter 14 and verse 1, and he reminds them that I'm leaving you, you're going to seek me and not find me, where I'm going, you can't come, you can't come now, but you're going to come later. Don't allow your heart to be overwhelmed with trouble. And trouble simply means that when I'm going through difficult times, problems in my life, when distress and anxiety, when I have actually a disturbance in my emotions, 
Now, all of us go through that. I go through that. We all have times for that. But when my heart is overwhelmed with trouble, if I'm always in a place of emotional disturbance, if I find that my whole life can be described as anxious all the time, that's a dangerous place to be in. And God is telling us as believers that no matter what we experience in the world, that, that we can't give our hearts over to trouble. We can't allow emotional disturbance to dictate who I am and what I do. So God says, believe in me. He says, let not your heart be troubled, but you believe in God, believe also in me. He says, I want you to trust me. I want you to rely on me. I want you to believe and have faith in me. Now remember now, he came from the Father. He says, now in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there he may be also. Wow. So though you're going to seek me and not find me, though I'm going to a place you can't come, you can't come now, you're coming later, but it is needful for me to go so that I can prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I've got to come back and get you to take you to the place hmm, that I have prepared for you. The word prepare here is the same word that John will use in the book of Revelation chapter 21 in verse 2 where he is taken and he sees this heavenly city, this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and he uses the same words. He says that it is prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. That new Jerusalem is a place where Jesus is preparing and when the place is efficiently prepared, he's going to come back and receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going and we don't even know the way. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I truly and fully believe with all of my heart and trust Jesus' directions on how to get to his house. Now, just like I would trust your direction for telling me how to get to your house, Jesus came from the Father and he gives us the directions how to get to the Father's house. I trust it. I believe it with all of my heart that the only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. Of God's of GPS, if you will, God's plan of salvation. He shows us the way, and it's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philip did then say in the text, verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father that sufficeth us. The word means to satisfy. All you got to do is just show us the Father, and that would be satisfying to us. Jesus says, have I been so long with you, Philip? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. In verses 15 through 18, Jesus gives us a continual word of comfort for a troubled heart. He says then, if you love me then, you're going to keep my commandments. That's how we show God that we love him. He showed us that he loved us by giving up his son, the Lord Jesus. And we can only love him because he first loved us. We show God that we love him through obedience. And every day, through our choices, we have an opportunity to show God that we love him. He says, if you do it. 
you're going to obey my commandments. He says, and then I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. This another is not another of difference. This is another same. He says, I'm going to pray the Father, and he was going to give you another comforter, and he's going to abide with you forever. He is called the Spirit of Truth. Now, the world can't see him, he says, but you see him, and you know him, for he dwelleth with you. And he shall be in you in verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it's because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Wow. There it is. That is the key. Comfort for a troubled heart. That when I am feeling that uh, despair, when I am, am, am feeling and having the feelings of, of, of anxiety, when I have a disturbance in my emotion that continues, we all have it, but when it continues, if it's all day, every day, then it gives a key for the believer. But though I'm coming back for you, I'm never going to leave you. I'm giving you another comforter, and he will not only be with you like I was with you, but he's going to be in you. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. And those words to those disciples are the same words for the disciples today. God is not going to ever leave us comfortless. So much in soul that we have a built-in counselor. Now I have to do some things. I have to reckon that. He's given it to me, but I have to, to practice it in my life. I have to trust it. I have to come to the realization that this comforter, the Holy Spirit, is indwelled in me He's with me all the time. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's always there. I'm never alone. He's always with me. There'll never be any social distancing from the Holy Spirit of God. He is always there. No matter where I am, there he is also. If you're feeling trouble today, if you're having feelings of anxiety, if you're having disturbance in the emotions, you are not alone. We all have times in life when these things come upon us. But if I'm finding I'm disturbed all day, every day, every moment of the day, if this situation we find ourselves in right now, there's comfort for us. There is comfort for us. Let me give you five things before we close today. Number one, have faith in God. He says, if you believe God, believe also in me. That means to trust him, to rely upon him. I know we're seeing words that fail, but God's word won't fail. God is true, and he performs everything that he says. You can count on it. We're never going to be ashamed trusting and having faith in God. So number one, have faith in God. Trust in Him. Rely on Him. Number two, He says that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. I think one of the things that we need to do, I think we need to turn off all the voices. That there needs to be a point in our day we shut the, 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 the social media off, we shut the TV off, we shut all of the news stations off, and we open up the Word of God, and we hear what thus saith the Word of God, because it's going to comfort our souls. It is food for the soul. 
It anchors my emotions in the Lord. But we're hearing so many voices. And what is absent oftentimes is the voice of God through his word. Let's take some time each day. Turn everything off but the word of God. Open up the word of God and allow God to speak to you through his word. Number three, show God you love him. That's what he's looking for. He loves us. But he wants us to show him that we love him. What better time than times of trial? We're making all kinds of decisions. We have to make all kinds of changes. He says, now, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's re recommit ourselves. Let's commit ourselves to showing. Let every day be a day of opportunity that God, here's a new day, and I want to show you how much I love you by doing what you commanded. Number four, practice the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. God prayed to the Father. Jesus did, and he says he's going to send a comforter to you. He came into our life the moment we trust Christ as Savior. Romans says, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. There's no way we can belong to God without having the Holy Spirit in our life. In fact, he is the earnest of the relationship. So he's there. I must consciously depend on him. How do I know he's there? What does, how, does, how does he speak to me? He's called the spirit of truth. When truth comes to your mind, the Bible says that he will bring to your remembrance all the things that I've said. And so when you're going to make a decision and truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit bringing truth to you. He's the spirit of truth. If I'm angry at someone and God says the spirit of God is telling me to forgive that person, don't quench the spirit. Don't grieve him. But the Christian life is this whole idea of walking in the spirit and, and being guided by the spirit. How do I know if the spirit is leading or if I'm leading? The spirit always leads according to truth. What God says and what he does is always consistent. The spirit of God will never lead you to do something that God's word tells you not to. So we can count on it. We also see the fruit. That can't be reproduced. That can only show forth itself if the Spirit of God is in me, the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the meekness, the temperaments. All of these things show that the Spirit of God is indwelling in us. And finally, if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I trust the fact that Jesus gives us the way home. And he says that the only way is through him. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. And all you have to do today is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. You were buried. You rose again. Come into my life and save me. Paul makes it very clear that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. God has given us comfort for a troubled heart. Let's put it into practice today. Let's start practicing it in our lives. Let's share it with others. They also may be comforted during these troubled times. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God today. It's not my word, it's your word. Help us to receive it as not the word of man, but the word of God. Help us to activate it and be determined that we're going to be obedient to it because in doing so, we show you that we love you. Again, I thank you for the first responders today, those that are working on the front lines to keep us safe and to protect us. Thank you for the pastors in the churches and how we're all finding new ways to continue to minister to your people. Thank you for our educators who are finding new ways to uh, ensure that our uh, children in the education. Thank you for those men and women who are protecting us and putting their life on the line that we might have the freedoms that we have. 
But most of all, we're thankful for the Lord Jesus. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit who dwells us and who comforts us. All these things we ask, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. With thanksgiving. Amen. Would you join me?